is out of the book of Esther. Now, if you're not churchy, you're going to go, where is Esther? Well, Esther's before the book of Psalms, and it's after Nehemiah, okay? If you look in there, you'll find the story of Esther. Esther's a very interesting book. It's, it's, it's a story that if you were to make a movie, and there actually is a movie made about it, but if you were to make a movie, this is a pretty good book to choose if you wanted to make a movie out of one of the books of the Bible, because there's, there's plots and there's subplots, there's, there's kings, there's princesses, there's queens, there's all this stuff going on. Amazing, amazing storyline. And I'm going to give you a bit of the background, and then we'll jump in with a new part today. We're going to be in Esther 3, uh, 7 through 15 today. And if you got a Bible, feel free to pull that out. There's some in the pews or chairs in front of you, and there's some in the welcome center. You can use your iPhone or your iPad, whatever you've got. But I'll give you a little background on some of the main characters and plot lines that we've experienced thus far. First of all, uh, a guy starts the story off by the name of King Ahasuerus, or as we know him better by his Greek name, King Xerxes. Now, as we've looked at Xerxes, we've discovered he's kind of a Xerxes, okay? He's not a good guy. Uh, we voted, and everybody voted, he's a bad guy, all right? And, and he just doesn't treat people well. He doesn't, particularly the women in his life, he doesn't treat them well. And we're going to see some of the consequences of his uh, carelessness about people coming today. And, and anyhow, at the time he becomes king, he takes over for his father. His father had expanded the kingdom ex- just extremely large kingdom. We're talking from Pakistan to modern day Greece and all across northern Africa. A huge swath of the planet was under this man's control. And at the time that he comes to power, he he becomes the wealthiest man on the planet and the most powerful man on the planet in charge of the greatest army on the planet. And so this is this is a big deal. This is a big guy. This is an important guy. And one of the first things he does is celebrate himself because you see it's all about Xerxes it's all about his ego he spends six months throwing a party to have people come and just kind of celebrate and worship and bow down before him basically it's a buffet and open bar for six straight months for all of his political and all of his military leaders Uh, just just a huge thing to make a big deal about him well in the story he's got this queen a lady by the name of Vashti now he says, part towards the end of this big old party, as he's sitting there with all of his drinking buddies, he asks her to come and do something that's fairly inappropriate, and come and kind of show herself off to him and all of his pals. Well, the queen says, no, I'm not going to do that. Now you need to know that Xerxes is the kind of guy that nobody has ever said no to. And so when he hears no from his queen, what does he do? He kicks her to the curb, boots her, he's done with her. Because all of his all, all of his advisors are going, you know, King, if you let her get away with that, when we go home, our wives are going to want to say the same thing to us, and we don't want that. And so he gets rid of her, and this leads to the part of the story which is kind of like the Bachelorette. Um, if you've seen that on TV, I don't recommend it, but you may have seen it. Uh, and so he kind of opens up these trials and invites uh, his eunuchs. He's got a team of guys who go out through his land and find all the beautiful virgins and bring them in to his harem so that they might have a chance to become queen. And that is where Esther and Mordecai enter into our story. Mordecai is a guy who's working in the government. And uh, he's adopted his young niece, a lady by the name of Esther. And he's working in this government and she ends up in this pool of virgins in the harem of the king and uh, she begins to work her way through and we hear all these stories about you know they, they spent 12 months or six months applying oils to their skins and and scents to their skins so that when they'd get to be presented to the king they would smell and look at their best right and so that's what these ladies were doing as they were preparing for the king and and Mordecai has this governmental job and we heard about this that he's working down at the city's gates he's transacting some work for the government and he hears of a plot and it's a plot to assassinate the king <clears throat> and he hears this and he says well I probably should do something about this right and at this point Esther has found favor with the king and has you know, to become the new queen. And so he says, well, I probably should tell Esther that there's a hit being put out on her new husband, the king. So he passes that along, and she passes that along to the king. The king has it investigated, and lo and behold, it's true. 
these two guys are going to try to kill the king off with their heads they get hung you know they get knocked out by the king so everything's great everything's safe you'd think at this point the king's going to reward good old mordecai right way to go buddy thanks for saving my life here's a gold chariot for your effort right wrong that's not what happens instead this other guy this this not nice guy this guy by the name of haman he instead gets a promotion instead of mordecai and what you need to know about Haman is that Haman comes from a group of people called the Agagites. And if you don't know your Old Testament history, the Agagites are this people group who have been enemies of the Israelites since the very, very beginning. When the Israelites came and they took the land way, way, way back earlier in the, New Te- in the Old Testament, when the Israelites came into Israel and they took the land, the very first people to attack them and go to war with them? The Agagites. They were like early terrorists in the life of the Israelites. And they forever have been enemies because of it. And so that kind of brings you up to speed with where we're at today in the story. Um, with, with now this guy, who is not a pleasant guy, Haman, having just gotten a promotion, having just gotten promoted to basically being the right hand of the king. And uh, we find him kind of in a position of power and authority, and it sets up where we're going to go. So if you're going to follow along, chapter 3, verse 7 in the story of Esther, and I'm going to read some of it, and we'll talk about it as we go if you haven't been following, and uh, we'll see what God has in store for us. And there it says in chapter 3, verse 7, In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, the twelfth year of King Osiris. Well, why does this matter? Well, this matters because this story of Esther is a historical story. Uh, We have this story both in Scripture as well as outside of Scripture. And and what it shows is, as we listen to this story of Esther, is that God works throughout history. Esther's a unique book. It doesn't doesn't mention the name of God at any point. We have to look for God in between the words as we read this story. We kind of are searching the shadows to see God. But if you look for God through this story, His fingerprints are all over it. And, and, And it is that way in our lives many times. We don't always know where God is working in our lives, but we look back at our history and we go, oh, there God was. And it's very much the same with the story of Esther. God works in people's lives in amazing ways, and he works through nations as well. Then it says, they cast purr, which is to mean they, they cast lots, kind of like you know the rolling of dice. And you'll hear more about this later in the book of Esther. Uh, this, this process institutes the Feast of Purim, which is a, a feast that is still celebrated by Jews to this day. And it's named after this. And what's going on here is there's this casting of lots, this rolling of dice, so to speak. They're, they're asking of the spiritual realm and the spirits and the demons to, to guide their dice, to help them make decisions, to put a plan together as we have discovered, for the destruction of the people of God. And and Satan is always involved in these kinds of things. Paul says it this way in Ephesians 6. He says, our battle is not uh, against flesh and blood. Our war is not against flesh and blood. But instead, it's against powers and principalities and spirits. Uh, Haman's been elevated to this position of authority, and he's by no way a victim in this story. And he's empowered to make some decisions that, that are going to potentially have a destructive impact on the people of God. And, and as we talked about a little bit last week, this, this seems to really be the fingerprint of Satan and his demons all over it, who are trying to organize this plan for the destruction of God's people. And then it says, and they cast it month after month till the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. So, so they're, they're, they're coming and asking for guidance from the demonic realm to put this plan together for the genocide of God's people. Then it says, And then Haman said to King Osiris, There is a certain people, these are the Jews, who are scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all of the provinces of your kingdom. So he's coming and he's saying, Hey, hey king, big problem. There's these people. And they're everywhere in your kingdom. And then he says to the king, You know why they're a problem, king? Because their laws are different from those of every other people. You see, they have this thing that they call the scriptures. And they do not keep the king's law. You know what? Hey, king, they're kind of like Vashti, right? 
He's planting these seeds of doubt in his ear. They, they, they might say no to you, king. And so Haman says to him, so that it's not the king's profit to tolerate them. Hey, king, these people aren't good for you. Hey, buddy king, I'm just looking out for your best interest, right? And so he says, so if it would please the king, let it be decreed that they would all be destroyed. So here's the plan. This is what he says to the king. Hey, king, I will pay you 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business so that they might put it into the king's treasury. So what he says here, basically, Haman is saying, Hey, king, I'm going to put a ridiculous sum of money in your hands if you allow me to get rid of these people and this problem. So what does scripture tell us? It says, Ahasuerus, it says, so the king took off his signet ring. You know, this is the old ring where you'd like stamp into the, the, the wax that you might drip from a candle or whatever, and that stamp would give the stamp of approval. You know it was official. You know this came from the desk of the king. So he took off his signet ring, it says, from his hand, and he gave it to Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money is given to you and the people also to do with them as it seems good to you. So question for you. How do you tell stories in such a way that they benefit you? You ever do that? Right? We all do that, don't we? I mean, it starts off when we're little kids, doesn't it? Like, like you slug your brother in the shoulder, he starts crying, and you run to mom and dad to tell them what happened, and you blame him for the problem, right? Anybody ever done that? You're all innocent? <laughs> Come on. You can hear them screaming in the other room, and you run to mom and dad and try to get there first, because if you tell your story first, they're going to believe you, hopefully, rather than you slugging your brother. <laughs> Proverbs says it rightly. Everyone seems right until the other side is heard, right? And here's what Haman does. He runs to Xerxes. He says, hey, 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 let, let me explain to you exactly what's going on, Mr. King. Uh, there's these people, they're called the Jews, and they have this book, it's called the Scripture, and they obey laws that come from a God, and, and you're kind of like God, and they're going to follow this other God and not follow you and they think their God is bigger and better than you in fact and, and, and that's a real problem right and so I'm here to just I'm, I'm, I'm a helper I'm, a, I'm the kind of guy that likes to help people so I'm just here to fix your problems Mr. King let me destroy them and let me plunder everything that they have and uh, let me take all of their money and worldly possessions and wealth and here's what I will do I'll give you half We'll put it in the government funds, and you can do with it whatever it is that you want. And the amount of money that he's talking about was roughly half of all the tax income that would come in in a year at that time. This is a massive business opportunity for the king. There's profit to be made. All we need to do, king, is just, you know, kill these evil people and plunder their goods and... I'll split it with you. What do you think? Well, Xerxes, uh, he doesn't do his homework. Xerxes doesn't get both sides of the story. Xerxes doesn't investigate the facts. He says, well, that sounds like a pretty good plan. Yeah, I, I like money. Yeah, free money. <laughs> sounds pretty good to me. Here's, here's the power of attorney. Right? Here's, here's my signet ring. Go and do as you please. You now have control over life and death. You know, sometimes it's really easy just to get partial information and, unfortunately, misinformation and to make a decision that affects a lot of people that you don't even know. You see, Xerxes doesn't know these Jewish people, right? Xerxes doesn't love these people. And Xerxes only gets the report about these people from Haman. And here's the truth in the story. Leaders can get into real trouble when you're only dealing with numbers and not with faces. For those of us who are leaders of any sort, whether you're a business leader or leader in politics or ministry, God knows numbers, but He also sees the faces. He loves people, not just crowds, but each and every one of us. People with faces and with names and with stories. 
But you see, Xerxes, he doesn't care about people. He only really cares about himself. All he cares about is the numbers. And he's willing to reduce the number of people if it's going to increase the number of dollars. Now, before we get too judgmental of that, we sometimes do things like this, don't we? Every election year, right? That signet ring goes on our finger and the case is made from partial truths from both sides. Don't believe anything any of them are saying because I think they're all full of it. That's my opinion. I'm not going to get political. I just don't trust any of them. That's equal distrust. But they all, they all are trying to convince you, he said this, she did that, da-da-da, da-da-da. I get these mailers in my mailbox. Right now I'm sure yours is the same. It's handy because I need to start my fireplace, so I don't, don't <laughs> mind that they send them to me because they get put to good use. But they send you all these things, and if, if you believe all of this, uh, well, if you believe all of this, and a lot of it is probably at some level true, we're all broken, and including the people we've tried to lead, our country, our politicians. They're broken, just as broken as we are. And the problem, though, is, you know, we got wealth. If you're rich, you vote for this person, so they'll lower your taxes. If you're poor, you'll vote for this person, so they raise the taxes, yada, yada, you know, You know how that works. But, but it's all lots of times based on misinformation. It's based on, well, what am I going to get out of this, rather than what is actually in our best interests. And so we have to do be a little careful as we read through this and get critical of Xerxes. And, because many times we make decisions off of partial information that aren't always in the best interest of everybody. And so when we read a story in Scripture, uh, we have two choices in the ways in which we read. We can read it religiously, as I've mentioned before, where we say, oh, there's bad people and there's good people. I want to be like the good people. Or... We read scripture, as I think we should, where we say, there's bad people, and there's Jesus. And I happen to fit, not in the Jesus category, but the bad people category, right? And so, as we, as we do this, and as we read this, we have to ask ourselves, how am I actually, maybe, a little like Xerxes? That apart from the grace of God, that I could make a terrible decision about somebody else. And that's not the only question that we should ask there. If we're going to really be honest, and we're going to ask how are we like Xerxes, we should examine ourselves and say, well, how am I kind of lazy and greedy like him too, right? Because most of us are kind of prone towards laziness occasionally, right? We don't always do our homework like we should. We don't always do the research that we should. We don't always investigate like we should. And see, Xerxes was told, hey, Xerxes, there's these bad people living among your people. They're hurting you. You should destroy them. He says, well, okay. I don't like bad people. Sounds good. Let's destroy them. Right? That's the story of Esther. And leaders are not just to make decisions. If you are a leader, you are to make right decisions. And that takes having the right information. Now you might say, well, hi, Pastor, I'm not greedy. How many decisions do we make solely based upon this will generate more income towards me? Hmm? Some of us make those decisions, right? But sometimes the best thing is not what's in our interests, but is instead in the interests of others. Does Xerxes need this money? No, he's the richest man on the planet. Xerxes doesn't need anything. He has it all. This guy, as I mentioned before, just, just threw a six-month-long party for tens of thousands of people. And not only that, he's got a palace, but not only does he have a palace, he has two of them, as if one wasn't enough. Xerxes is doing just fine. And Xerxes is basically worshipped as if he's a god. And this guy has more money than he could ever spend and more money than he knows what to do with. But the Bible's right. He who loves money never has enough. So we need to be careful. We need to be cautious. We need to ask, how are we sometimes maybe like Xerxes? We believe things about people, negative things that are said about them, criticisms, gossip. We don't even necessarily know them. We might not have even met them. We haven't even checked out the facts. And yet... Sometimes we believe it. 
And then we make decisions based solely upon the bottom line, not on the glory of God and the good of others. Friends, this is so, so incredibly important because many of us are leaders in many different capacities. Leaders in our church, our community, our family. Some of you are leaders in business. And I don't, I don't want to just be a, a self-righteous, judgmental, hypocritical, moralistic people who say, Oh, Haman and Xerxes, they're bad, but I'm good. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that I'm good and I'm not like them. But instead, we need to be honest and say, You know what? If I'm not cautious, if I'm not careful, I am a broken and sinful person and I might make a bad decision just like them. I might do something that punishes others unnecessarily. I might cause additional suffering. I could be like Xerxes and be lazy and not do my homework. I could hand away my authority, not love people, not know people. And just count numbers instead of seeing the faces behind those numbers. So something that can be very deeply convicting for a church like ours. Any church for that matter. We can be so caught up in how many people were here, how much money came in, and how many kids were here, and all those kinds of things, and count the numbers, and forget there's a story behind every single one of those. Now I will regularly invite you to Invite your friends, invite your family, invite your neighbors, invite your enemies. I don't care, they're all welcome here. I'd love to have them. If we have an empty seat, I'd love to have it filled. But is it because I care about how many people are sitting in this room? No. I care that people get to hear about Jesus. And hopefully we can keep that as our focus. But we have to be careful. We have to work at that. We have to be intentional about it. We have to realize that if we don't, thus we might go astray. And so we have to always keep in mind not to be moralistic and religious, but instead love Jesus and love others. Because apart from that, apart from the grace of God, the inclination of every human heart is towards destruction. So what's going to happen now in this story? I mean, it's quite the mini-series we have going on. It would make a great TV special or, like I said, a movie. You know, it's kind of like... If you tune in next week, right, they leave you with the kind of the cliffhangers each week. I've got to see what's happening, you know. So we've got Mordecai. We've got an Agagite. We've got Esther. And still to this point in the story, Esther really hasn't said anything. She hasn't done anything yet of note. What's going to happen with her? Xerxes, he just gave away all the kingdom's authority and power. What happens next week, Right? Well, here's the next episode as you're reading through Scripture. It says, Then the king's scribes were summoned on the thirteenth day of the, th of the first month, and an edict, according to all that Haman commanded, was written. See, Haman writes up this policy, and the king just blindly signs off on it. Whatever you, whatever you want, buddy, sure. It says, It was written to the king's satraps, which are the, these provincial rulers, the governors over all of the provinces, and to the officials of all the people, to every province in its own scripts, so to all the different languages it was written, to all the different people in their own language. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and signed with the king's signet ring. Remember the ring that Haman has. And out goes this decree. Kill all of God's people. Now, at this point, how many of you are expecting God to intervene, right? If you've not read the story, you're thinking, okay, God's going to swoop in, bolt of lightning, and knock this guy out, right? Or maybe he's going to perform some other miracle, or maybe an angel will appear, or a prophet of God. But God doesn't speak in the story. He doesn't act in an outward, obvious way. And in fact, it just keeps on going. In verse 13, it says, Letters were sent by courier to all of the king's provinces with instructions to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate the Jews. All of God's people. That's heavy language. Destroy, kill, annihilate. Young and old. Little girls with pigtails. Little boys who are swimming in the river, rivers. The, the, the toddlers. The, the old grandmas. The, the, the old men who are so deaf that they can't even hear when you kick their doors down and you come for them, right? Go get them. 
All of these people should die. Folks, that's satanic. It's demonic. God brings life. Satan brings death. And this is evil unvarnished. Evil unmasked. Through a man who is unrepentant. And that's all it takes. is a king with an unrepentant heart. Women and children, all of them, in one day it says. Xerxes has the largest army in the history of the world up until this point. Herodotus, who's a a Greek historian, as we've learned in previous weeks, says that his standing army was hundreds of thousands of men, and the total army was in the millions. And the decree comes to the commanders and the generals, grab your weapons and go find all the Jews and murder them all. Slaughter them all. You see, people are not good by nature. People are not morally upright and devout by nature. This is the human heart that we're seeing in this story, untethered from the restraining grace of God. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree, it says in Scripture, to every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. So literally, they are announcing in advance that we're going to come and kill all of you. Can you imagine the the terror and the horror that went through the people of God? It's coming, the execution of all of us. See, friends, we are all appointed a time to die, every one of us. But we tend not to live under the terror of that being like a set day. We don't know the day. We don't live in fear of a, a specific day at a specific moment. And and that's why when when we see these tremendous disasters and tragedies, they they grip international attention and focus. I mean, there are funerals that go every day in the world, but it's the big things like this that get the attention. And so the couriers went out hurriedly by the order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel, and the king Haman sat down. To do what? After he has this decree go out, what's he do? He sits down and has a drink with... Haman. This is what a lot of people do after they close a big business deal, right? They sit down, enjoy a meal, come together. They haven't really prayed about its implications. They don't know what impact it's going to have on the rest of the world. They just say, deal's done, ink is dry. Let's go celebrate, right? What a great day. Boy, we made some money today, right? Oh, boy, we're so rich. We're so powerful. Yeah, well, we might have destroyed some people along the way, but yeah, blah di da Right? He doesn't know him. He doesn't care about him. There's nothing wrong with making money, right? But there's something horribly wrong with making money and destroying innocent people. And so at the end of the day, the king sits down, has a drink. But an interesting little note in the scripture here in Esther, it says, But the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. And what this means is when the citizens heard this decree coming from the king, those who were not Jewish, many of them were like, what? These are our friends, right? These are good people. These are hardworking people. These are our co-workers. These are are our neighbors. These, These are decent people. They're good citizens. What do you mean we're gonna wipe them out? And it is my prayer, folks, that we would live in such a way that when persecution comes, and and God warns us persecution will come, when persecution comes or oppression comes against Christianity, that those who are non-Christian would do just like in this story, and they would look and go, why are they being persecuted? These people serve our city. These people serve our community. These people love us. Even though we don't worship the same God, they love us well. We don't want them to die, right? You see, God's people are to live lovingly. Lovingly in our culture in such a way so that even non-Christians know God's love because we love them. And that is what happened in this story. The world needs to see our love. Let our love shine. Let it set us apart so that when oppression, persecution comes, Even those who don't worship our God would come to our defense. 
One of the great stories within this story is we need to learn how to love because we were first loved. So your homework is to go forth and share that love with the world this week. Go find people, maybe people who don't go to our church, people who don't know God, but love them anyhow. And be a shining light, an example of God's love wherever you go. Amen? Let's pray.